hired a hitman to take out my daughter. I should have done it myself. I adore my husband, but there's something that effectively ruins our relationship. His daughter, Fair. I don't want to sound like I'm some evil human, but Fair was different from a normal girl. She spends most of her time in wilderness patches behind our estate, where she's taken up an extreme interest in traps, snares, nets, that sort of thing. Her father even bought her a hunting knife for Christmas, and the way she smiled with it was simply terrifying. I've tried to mention it to my spouse, but he seems determined to overlook any sign of his daughter's abnormality. He's also determined to ignore the rotting smell that seems to emanate from her room, and the reports of missing cats in the local neighborhood. I don't want to rock the boat, but I'm convinced it was her. And last week I think I finally had all my subconscious suspicions confirmed. It started with my husband leaving for a business trip, meaning I was alone with Fair at the house. Luckily for me, work usually meant that I always arrived home late, so it's not like we've had to eat together and play happy families or anything. We both keep to ourselves, but any illusion of normalcy shattered last Friday. After forgetting some files at home, I went back to retrieve them, assuming Fair would be at school. However, as I walked into the house, a thick, coppery stench seemed to hang in the air. Had something died in the vents? But as I stepped into the kitchen, I saw it. The wide windows and countertops covered in what looked like a heaving mass of fur. Fur and blood. My ears gradually focused, and I could hear a horrific noise. It was someone chewing. Fair stood in the center of the room, face buried in the stomach of a fuzzy kitten. My brain tried to translate it as something sweet. A cuddly gesture of affection, perhaps. But as my stepdaughter raised her head, I saw blood smeared over her face, trickling down her neck onto her neat little blouse. I took two steps back, opened the door, quietly left the house and drove to a nearby viewpoint. I inhaled. I stepped out of the car. I exhaled. I vomited. I'd had enough. I reached for my phone. Luckily, I had memorized the phone number, and besides, I was already a respected client of theirs. In the corporate kingdom, it always helps to know a hitman. I waited a week. Usually my agents work extremely quickly, so I expected she would be dead by then. But as I woke up this morning to go to work, I found something lying outside my bedroom door. A human heart, with a bloody Polaroid picture lying next to it. My heart pounded in my chest as I picked up the Polaroid picture. The man in the photograph was none other than the hitman I had hired to take care of Fair. He was the one who was supposed to rid us of this nightmare, yet somehow, he ended up dead. My agents were the highest quality hitmen. Renowned for taking out the highest level targets, yet he couldn't get past this girl. You shouldn't have done that whispered the demonic child at the bottom of the stairs. My blood ran cold as pure adrenaline took over my body. I rushed straight into my room as she looked up at me with her familiar sinister grin. I locked myself in my room for that entire week, with the smell of blood slowly getting stronger. I don't know why she didn't force the door down. If she was able to take down my hitman, she should be able to kill me in an instant. But she didn't. But I don't think this was for good reason. I was being tormented in that room. Every day she would start singing outside my room, which throughout the week progressed to an ear-piercing screeching sound. My ears started to hurt more and more to the point where it felt like one of my eardrums had burst. Everything was becoming muffled and I started bleeding from my ears. I eventually came to my senses, deaf in both ears and with blood leaking down my neck. I realized that I needed to leave, and leave as quickly as possible. If my hitman couldn't take her out, I would need to do it myself. But being stuck in that room slowly dying would get me nowhere. I could still feel vague thumping from downstairs. It's an old house, and you can feel every movement shake through the foundations. So I knew I was being ignored right then at least. I shuffled over to the bedroom window, which was thankfully already open. Closed windows create stuffy rooms, so I make it a habit to keep them open. I managed to slowly make my way down the outside wall while hearing a constant thumping within the house. Before I could take the time to properly process my own actions, I had started the car and backed out of my driveway. The last thing I saw in the rearview mirror before I turned the corner at the end of our street was a small white figure with dark hair crouched on the pavement outside our home. Red soaked the dress she wore, and despite my deafness, I'm sure I could hear her rage. My stepdaughter clearly isn't human. Her hair was very, very dark. It doesn't seem to pick up light. I've never seen it shine. But her mouth is what freaks me out the most. Her lips are crusty, in the scabbed old blood kind of way. They're deep red, and I don't think it's lipstick. I've never actually been in her room. I generally try to avoid encroaching on her territory, but she doesn't strike me as the makeup type. They also shine, permanently. Like a fresh wound, she had transformed into this monster. This isn't what she normally looks like. Just the fact she was able to kill hired professionals makes her completely inhumane. No young, unaware human should be able to do that. I didn't want any more lives to be taken, so that was when I decided it was up to me. I tried calling my husband, but he wasn't picking up. Something was going on between the two of them. I needed to find out who the hell my stepdaughter and my husband were. Luckily, I have a lot of connections, as well as a chain of people who owed me favors, including people that work in legal fields with extensive records and IDs for just about everyone in the U.S. But after asking them to check for fair, no records existed whatsoever. It was either a fake name or she isn't human, but I imagine it's both. As for my husband, he's registered but has no child or ex-wife. However, there was a very interesting series of articles regarding a missing family. A couple and their young daughter vanished from their home, leaving no traces. After a three-week search and numerous appeals, the wife's body was found in the center of a nearby forest, with her heart torn out. The official explanation was that the husband murdered his wife and child, which is an extremely weak explanation to close the case. However, the case is considered closed, despite the fact that the culprit was never caught. However, I'm not convinced. 
mostly because they included photographs alongside which is unmistakably my husband. I didn't think he committed a double murder ten years ago, which is exactly why I decided to ask him about it myself after stocking up on supplies, toiletries, and a cheap change of clothes. It's shockingly cheap to access information on where a person has been. Within a very short space of time, I had a list of all the locations my husband had been in the past week, although there was no data from the previous two days. That, coupled with the Polaroid picture, led me to his hideout. I drove to the town, the journey taking up most of the morning. Pulling into the first fuel stop I could find, I happened to glance up into the greasy cafe attached to the petrol station while filling my car. There he was, as if he was waiting for me. I didn't rush. I got the sense that he had chosen the window seat so that I could see him. I paid for my fuel, parked the car in a bay, paid the parking fare, and walked into the cafe, sliding into the booth seat opposite him. There was none of the warmth in his face that usually resided there, and his face seemed scrunched. Getting the overwhelming sense that I was living out a scene from a film, I opened my mouth to comment on something, anything. I was cut off by a low voice as he began to speak. He began to explain the tragic story of he and his wife's daughter, Faye. His tone softened as he described her red curls, the game she liked to play, the toys they bought her. She had died at the age of two, choking to death on an apple. Ten years ago, that fateful night, a hooded figure had visited the distraught couple, promising to bring her back. His voice broke as he described the scene to me. He walked into the house so late at night, through the locked door. We were terrified, but then it told us how to get fair back. Breath shuddering, he stared deeply into his coffee and started again. He told us to take her body to the forest. He told us to bury her shallow and then she'd come back. He didn't tell us that there was a price. His expression seemed to grow even duller, stealing itself against the memories. Completely lifelessly, he told me how the hooded figure had appeared again. How it had pinned Fair's mother the ground, carving her heart out her chest with a jutting talon. How my husband had watched in shock as the figure uncovered Fair from her grave, smearing blood on her small face. How Fair's eyes had opened, and how she had devoured her mother's heart with relish. And how her horrified father couldn't bear to kill her. I looked at him then, trying to imagine raising a monster that you couldn't help but love. Turning a blind eye to the rotting smell coming from her room. He turned from me then, staring intently out of the window. There's more, and I'm so sorry, but fair. She needs blood to survive, and she needs hearts to survive. I had hoped, I hoped that she'd kill you while I was away, but you're too smart. He faced me, oblivious to the shock and hurt on my face. I'm sorry. The flash of anger on his previously broken face betrayed the twisted mind inside. My husband was insane. And with a jolt, I realized that the cafe had emptied while he spoke. It was only us. And Fair, suddenly appearing out of nowhere to stand behind her father. Her mouth spread into a slow grin and I flinched and grabbed my ears as I heard the same screeching noise that she made before. I raised my head to see my husband lunging towards me, hands outstretched and face twisted into a snarl. Flinging myself to the side, I practically fell out of the booth as Fair spat blood on the ground behind her father's seat. Keeping the table between us, I backed up, reaching into a convenient jacket pocket for my iron hammer. As my husband shimmied out of the booth and lumbered towards me, I swung the hammer as violently as I could, connecting with his head. I couldn't hear, but I could feel. I felt the hard resistance of skull give way to soft brain tissue. I felt the spattering of blood and pulp spray my face. I felt the low, guilty mumble of my conscience. What have I done? I loved that man, and the overwhelming feeling of satisfaction. He wanted me dead. I could also feel Fair's scream. I shivered, and looked up to see her standing far too close. Tears mixed with the blood on her face, creating a blotched landscape of red on her cheeks. And for a second I felt hollow. How could I do this to her? When I looked at her, all I saw was that innocent girl that I used to love. I saw my husband, the love of my life, dead next to me. That feeling vanished as she crouched, plunged her hands into his chest, raking her nails into his flesh and tearing it open. It was animalistic. I felt the bile rise in my throat as she carefully raised her father's heart into the air, blood still spilling onto the floor like a demented waterfall. The stench hit my nose. It was worse than the smell of decay in her room. It smelled of something that should be alive. She locked eyes with me and maintained eye contact as she tore into the heart of her own father as though it were nothing but yesterday's leftovers. As though he had never been important to her. Blood flowed from the heart, dripping onto the cutesy floral dress Fair had worn that day. My stepdaughter smiled at me, bearing red teeth. Then she lowered her head to her father's chest and rested it there. A macabre vision of a normally familiar gesture. A twisted father and daughter bonding moment. A few moments went by. I don't know how long, but my stepdaughter had already had her feeding now. That's when I saw the blue lights. I was tackled to the floor by the police. Someone had heard the screams and reported us. The last thing I saw as the police dragged me away, tearing the bloodied hammer from my grip, was Fair and her slow, sweet smile. A princess decked in red. Lips as red as blood. Eyes as red as coals. And hands as red as someone who knows they've just gotten away with murder. What would the police believe? That I had just seen my stepdaughter turn into a devil and eat her father alive? Or that I was an evil stepmother that tried killing my innocent stepdaughter and husband? As you can imagine, they didn't believe my rambled, confused explanation of why I beat my husband to death with a hammer. Fair will be fine. They'll listen to her. She's the poor little victim, trapped with an evil witch from a fairy tale. A villain.